Chapter Forty Nine of Far from the Madding Crowd. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter Forty Nine. Oak's Advancement. A Great Hope. The later autumn and the winter drew on apace and the leaves lay thick upon the turf of the glades and the mosses of the woods. Bathsheba, having previously been living in a state of suspended feeling which was not suspense, now lived in a mood of quietude which was not precisely peacefulness. While she had known him to be alive, she could have thought of his death with equanimity, but now that it might be she had lost him, she regretted that he was not hers still. She kept the farm going, raked in her profits without caring keenly about them, and expended money on ventures because she had done so in bygone days, which, though not long gone by, seemed infinitely removed from her present. She looked back upon that past over a great gulf, as if she were now a dead person, having the faculty of meditation still left in her, by means of which, like the mouldering gentlefolk of the poet's story, she could sit and ponder what a gift life used to be. However, one excellent result of her general apathy was the long-delayed installation of Oak as bailiff. But he, having virtually exercised that function for a long time already, the change, beyond the substantial increase of wages it brought, was a little more than a nominal one addressed to the outside world. Boldwood lived secluded and inactive. Much of his wheat and all his barley of that season had been spoilt by the rain. It sprouted, grew into intricate mats, and was ultimately thrown to the pigs in armfuls. The strange neglect which had produced this ruin and waste became the subject of whispered talk among all the people round, and it was elicited from one of Bulwood's men that forgetfulness had nothing to do with it, for he had been reminded of the danger to his corn as many times and as persistently as inferiors dared to do. The sight of the pigs turning in disgust from the rotten ears seemed to arouse Boldwood, and he one evening sent for Oak. Whether it was suggested by Bathsheba's recent act for promotion or not, the farmer proposed at the interview that Gabriel should undertake the superintendence of the lower farm as well as of Bathsheba's, because of the necessity Boldwood felt for such aid, and the impossibility of discovering a more trustworthy man. Gabriel's malignant star was assuredly setting fast. Bathsheba, when she learnt of this proposal, for Oak was obliged to consult her, at first languidly objected. She considered that the two farms together were too extensive for the observation of one man. Boldwood, who was apparently determined by personal rather than commercial reasons, suggested that Oak should be furnished with a horse for his sole use, when the plan would present no difficulty, the two farms lying side by side. Bulbum did not directly communicate with her during these negotiations, only speaking to Oak, who was the go-between throughout. All was harmoniously arranged at last, and we now see Oak mounted on a strong cob, and daily trotting the length and breadth of about two thousand acres in a cheerful spirit of surveillance, as if the crops all belonged to him the actual mistress of the one half and the master of the other, sitting in their respective homes in gloomy and sad seclusion. Out of this there arose, during the spring succeeding, a talk in the parish that Gabriel Oak was feathering his nest fast. "'Whatever you do think,' said Susan Tall, "'Gabriel Oak is coming here quite the damned. He now wears shining boots with hardly a hob in them, two or three times a week.' and a tall hat of Sundays, and hardly knows the name of Smockfrock. When I see people strut enough to be cut up into bantam-cocks, I stand dormant with wonder, and says no more." It was eventually known that Gabriel, though paid a fixed wage by Bathsheba, independent of the fluctuations of agricultural profits, had made an engagement with Bulwood, by which Oak was to receive a share of the receipts, a small share, certainly yet it was money of a higher quality than mere wages, and capable of expansion in a way that wages were not. 
some were beginning to consider Oak a near man. For though his condition had thus far improved, he lived in no better style than before, occupying the same cottage, paring his own potatoes, mending his stockings, and sometimes even making his bed with his own hands. But, as Oak was not only provokingly indifferent to public opinion, but a man who clung persistently to old habits and usages simply because they were old, there was room for doubt as to his motives. A great hope had latterly germinated in Bulwood, whose unreasoning devotion to Bathsheba could only be characterised as a fond of madness which neither time nor circumstance, evil nor good report, could weaken or destroy. This fevered hope had grown up again like a grain of mustard seed during the quiet which followed the hasty conjecture that Courtroy was drowned. He nourished it fearfully, and almost shunned the contemplation of it in earnest, lest facts should reveal the wildness of the dream. Bathsheba, having at last been persuaded to wear mourning, her appearance as she entered the church in that guise was in itself a weekly addition to his faith that a time was coming, very far off perhaps, yet surely nearing, when his waiting on events should have its reward. How long he might have to wait he had not yet closely considered. What he would try to recognise was that the severe schooling she had been subjected to had made Bathsheba much more considerate than she had formerly been of the feelings of others, and he trusted that, should she be willing at any time in the future to marry any man at all, that man would be himself. There was a substratum of good feeling in her. Her self-reproach for the injury she had thoughtlessly done him might be depended upon now to a much greater extent than before her infatuation and disappointment. It would be possible to approach her by the channel of her good nature, and to suggest a friendly business-like compact between them for fulfilment at some future day, keeping the passionate side of his desire entirely out of her sight. Such was Bellwood's hope. To the eyes of the middle-aged, Bathsheba was perhaps additionally charming just now. Her exuberance of spirit was pruned down. The original phantom of delight had shown herself to be not too bright for human nature's daily food, and she had been able to enter this second poetical phase without losing much of the first in the process. Bathsheba's return from a two months' visit to her old aunt at Norcombe afforded the impassioned and yearning farmer a pretext for inquiring directly after her, now possibly in the ninth month of her widowhood, and endeavouring to get a notion of her state of mind regarding him. This occurred in the middle of the haymaking, and Bulwood contrived to be near Liddy, who was assisting in the fields. "'I am glad to see you out of doors, Lydia,' he said pleasantly. She simpered, and wondered in her heart why he should speak so frankly to her. "'I hope Mrs. Troy is quite well after her long absence,' he continued, in a manner expressing that the coldest-hearted neighbour could scarcely say less about her. "'She's quite well, sir.' "'And cheerful, I suppose?' "'Yes, cheerful.' Uh, "'Fearful, did you say? Oh, no, I merely said she was cheerful.' "'Tells you all her affairs?' "'No, sir.' "'Some of them?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Mrs. Troy puts much confidence in you, Lydia, and very wisely, perhaps.' "'She do, sir. I've been with her all through her troubles, and was with her at the time of Mr. Troy's going and all. And if she were to marry again, I expect I should bide with her. She promises that you will. Quite natural, said the strategic lover, throbbing throughout him at the presumption which Liddy's words appeared to warrant, that his darling had thought of remarriage. No, she doesn't promise it exactly. I merely judge it on my own account. Yes, yes, I understand. When she alludes to the possibility of marrying again, you conclude, She never do allude to it, sir said Libby, thinking how very stupid Mr. Bulbul was getting. Uh, of course not, he returned hastily, his hope falling again. You needn't take quite such long reaches with your rake, Lydia. Short and quick ones are best. 
Uh, well, perhaps, uh, as she is absolute mistress again now, it is wise of her to resolve never to give up her freedom. My mistress did certainly once say, though not seriously, that she supposed she might marry again at the end of seven years from last year, if she cared to risk Mr. Troy's coming back and claiming her. Ah, six years from the present time. Said that she might. She might marry at once in every reasonable person's opinion, whatever the lawyers may say to the contrary. "'Have you been to ask them?' said Liddy, innocently. "'Not I,' said Bulwood, growing red. "'Liddy, you needn't stay here a minute later than you wish, so Mr. Oak says. I am now going on a little farther. Good afternoon.' He went away, vexed with himself and ashamed of having for this one time in his life done anything which could be called underhand. Poor Boldwood had no more skill in finesse than a battering-ram, and he was uneasy with a sense of having made himself to appear stupid, and what was worse, mean. But he had, after all, lighted upon one fact by way of repayment. It was a singularly fresh and fascinating fact, and though not without its sadness, it was pertinent and real. In little more than six years from this time, Bathsheba might certainly marry him. There was something definite in that hope, for admitting that there might have been no deep thought in her words to Lydia about marriage, they showed at least her creed on the matter. This pleasant notion was now continually in his mind. Six years were a long time, but how much shorter than never the idea he had for so long been obliged to endure! Jacob had served twice seven years for Rachel. What was six for such a woman as this? He tried to like the notion of waiting for her better than that of winning her at once. Burwood felt his love to be so deep and strong and eternal that it was possible she had never yet known its full volume, and this patience in delay would afford him an opportunity of giving sweet proof on the point. He would annihilate the six years of his life's, as if they were minutes. So little did he value his time on earth beside her love. He would let her see all those six years of intangible, ethereal courtship, how little care he had for anything but as it bore upon the consummation. Meanwhile, the early and the late summer brought round the week in which Greenhill Fair was held. This fair was frequently attended by the folk of Weatherbury. End of chapter forty nine. Recording by Simon Evers.